Saxon and Kids Burai Fighter for the NES, released in 1989. Or 1990 if you prefer. Before this gets kicked off as always, I'd like to pass along my acknowledgments to Matt Michael and Sarah Rowstone from Frying California, Rob Carballo and Lord Bifflecup from Geek Geek Radio, Manta Ray Vasquez the Lava Buster from Connecticut, Mike Bianchi and Justin DeLucia, some call me Johnny Ortiz, Erica Derrickson from America's Eye, Deirdre Fisher from Baltimore, Aaron Fapish from Retro Liberty, John Lester aka Gamester81, Dave White and Joe Redifer from GameSack, Glenn Ty Dubois, Bit Brigade, The Proto Men, Mega Ran, Samus with two M's, and Harley Bean. With that out of our system, onto the story. An advanced extraterrestrial race of cyborg mutants known as the Barai, which is supposed to be Hindu for evil, are hell-bent on conquering the entire universe due to their never-ending breeding of their population. It's now up to a lone galactic marauder, aka you obviously, to cease and desist all of their horseshit. Taking an epic headfirst dive into the gameplay aspect, what could one possibly expect but another shmup? A human-oriented shmup, I might add, in the style of Capcom's sidearms, Section Z, Legendary Wings, Forgotten Worlds, Natsume's Abadox and Scat, or Special Cybernetic Attack Team for short, Victokai's Troubleshooter aka Battle Mania, DreamWorks and NCS's Wings of War and the like. Upon selecting one of three difficulty modes, Eagle, Albatross, or Ace, Easy, Normal, or Hard, respectively, it's off through seven different areas as you're out to eradicate the Barai Menace. Your nuts and bolts control layout consists of your D-pad moving your rocket pack glide right around in eight available directions, firing your desired weapons in said available directions, no matter which way you face via the B button, and deploying a screen nuke via the A button, the latter of which will be further elaborated upon momentarily. Getting to the weapons themselves, with the obvious exception of the Big BF Standard Laser Cannon, there's three types that you can acquire and enhance, depending on which letter is displayed, ring laser or missile singularly, all of which are discharged at all times. While both the former and penultimate can be deployed in eight directions, the latter can be deployed in only one, right. However, upon advancing one of the three to a specific level, depending on how many of the same lettered amulet that you've procured in a row, your current weapon results in various effects, a three-way spread version of the ring, while another is fired parallel to the center, hence a four-way, your laser is deployed in two parallel directions simultaneously, and later four depending on your trajectory, and your missiles are deployed in duplicate, traveling in two parallel directions regardless of where you aim, along with occasional speed amulets that allow you to travel quicker. Should any adversary, projectile, or hazard happen to collide with you, or vice versa, or if you're ensnared between the screen's edge and a landscape portion, your ass is instantaneously disintegrated. In other words, expect the 4th of July to come wicked early this year. Thus your speed and current weapons firepower are relapsed back to piss all. Cause common shmup logic, I suppose? So, what types of threats are we dealing with, one might ask? Oh, I don't know, every goddamn thing! Various foes range from biological and mechanical creatures alike, insects including fleas, reptiles, what have you, as well as turrets, exploding orbs, the whole goddamn 15 Kuriks. Hazards ranging from rotating cotton like boulder rod tentacles, falling rock slabs, gigantic stone needles, I can go on for god knows how long and never zone out once. There are seven stages in total, all of which, with the exception of areas 3 and 6, are mostly forced auto-scrolling side view fortress areas guarded by a relentless pissant Barai creature that must be wiped the fuck out in order to proceed, from the gigantic crab and jossipede, all the way to Skullfang, Torchwing, and finally the nefarious slime dragon. The aforementioned stages 3 and 6 are top few areas in which you're tasked with pursuing and putting the old kibosh on their respective weaponized bases via their turrets, in the style of Namco Bandai's Bosconian, Technosoft's Thunder Force 2, and even the lesser known Cosmo tank on Game Boy by Atlas and Asuka Technologies and the like. But trust me when I say this, attempting to fulfill said myriad of goals is near goddamn suicide, and each time you get wasted, as always I don't mean the drunk or stone kind, no way. The enemy bases locations are always randomized, hence the introductory radar map shown which I strongly suggest studying beforehand. Oh, a few other hints I regretfully overlooked, every time you wipe out countless waves upon waves of adversaries, they'll leave behind these red pods which you can gather, and they'll raise your cobalt nuke gauge by each interval depending on how many, in said case each floor. Upon pressing A, your cobalt nuke is instantly discharged, thus promptly annihilating the piss out of every foe in sight, and deducting each fraction from your aforementioned gauge. And what's more of a huge advantage, when the entire gauge is filled up, an extra life is gained, and you can even acquire a rotating pod found within a hidden stage area for much advanced attack power and defense. The more of these you find, the easier your confrontations become. Notwithstanding these accessible perks, this game's got enough shit to fully guarantee your chances of survival are equivalent to a marsupial mole's testicles, jizz all in other words, thus pissing all over your expectations and leaving you in endless unrest for all time each opportunity it gets, which for the record is where the traditional upcoming subject comes into obligatory speculation. Concerning the overall essential control aspect, it's nothing short of fluid and receptive through and through, despite its semi-jarring and derelict impediments, which might result in your character's tendency to collide with any unsuspecting peril, thus being killed off faster than General Kale from Willow, and even more times than Kenny McCormick from South Park, and the invigorating gameplay procedure isn't too much of a buzzkill to grasp, oh shit no. Challenge-wise, as unequivocal as this game tends to be, if you're still expecting something of a spring picnic, oh how devastatingly wrong you'd be. Don't even bother. In fact, this makes Shikan the Forever Man, Hagane, and Silver Surfer combined fall under said category, but I fucking digress. 
therefore I wholeheartedly recommend referring back to the enemy and boss confrontation framework I addressed earlier being much more than just a matter of detecting every viable location of the former and even the clearest and azure lake weak points of the latter each and every effort you'll make in order to withstand all the anarchy core shit this game will throw your way is of the utmost importance because it'll blow your intuition and mentality worse than even a lifetime supply of every Italian pasta you've ever savored in your life or on the second and third stages and maybe onward is where the shit really starts to hit the fan in ways you've never fucking fathomed even on eagle and albatross not only do more of the immense and tougher swarms of adversaries appear in the most out of the blue patterns but it'll take more firepower to slaughter your agility and timing definitely have to be on point especially when it involves maneuvering your way out of tight corridors and unsuspecting enemy projectile streams thus boiling down my only possible survival pointers starting off with two lives more of which once again can be awarded by not only filling up the cobalt gauge with 29 red pods but also scoring 100,000 points infinite continues are available upon your final defeat intended with a short sweet and simple four digit password system consisting of common four letter words available at the start of each letter stage and they all differ depending on which difficulty level you kick things off with and must I mention that the latter can be written down or looked up online for given the game's repetitive nature and lack of true vibrance its graphics are far from a complete eyesore in addition to every meticulous depth and rich background layout most of the main and opposing character sprites have a unique flair to them in terms of their underlying actions likewise with the weapon effects excluding the semi-generic enemy projectiles notwithstanding the occasional flickering that occurs when there's a multitude of sprites on display cuz the NES for fuck's sake or the unexpected semi-corrupt hit detection cases also notice how some stages shift their direction midway through specifically areas 2 4 5 and 7 fused with the repetitive yet brilliantly integrated top few stage grounds in spite of those abrupt kinks the combined efforts of the short-lived taxan and kid the latter short for kindle imagine develop really had their eye on the ball in terms of delivering a top flight 8-bit wonder of the world presentation wise bottom line superb eye pleasing visuals are superb music and sound wise composed by norio nakagata again of hyankyo alien zombie nation and mercenary force fame all by meldak and life planning not to mention namco bandai's rbi baseball trilogy and macross and of course low g man and isolated warrior as kundred as the soundtrack is it's nothing short of remarkable with an array of moods running the game from massively heroic to upbeat and behemoths Sure, there are a few themes that overstay the hell out of their brief ass welcome, namely the boss theme in stages 3 and 6, but do a hell of a lot more than apply tension and pressure throughout, as you're tirelessly going all out and pursuing and evading every target and or threat that lies ahead. The sound effects run the game from run of the mill to just flat out ear raping and abrasive, not that I'm savagely harping on them whatsoever. My top 5 favorites from this game are the title intro anthem, stages 1 and 5, one whole track, stage 2 and 4, two separate tracks, and of course the ending anthem. Replayability wise, in total consideration of how criminally underrated this particular title is, due to every key fundamental and or hindrance I've laid down thus far, to which yet again I cannot stress enough in urging everyone to go back, combined with the multiple difficulty settings resulting in their underlying endings. As long as you're able to circumvent all its mind numbing turmoil and take the earlier established strategies into adamant consideration, you'll want nothing more than to spontaneously be warping back into Bri Fighter time and time and time again. Seriously, why even bother passing this up? Before I forget, there's both a deluxe Game Boy part and a Game Boy Color remake, the latter of which was released here under the generic title Space Marauder through H Tech, both not long after the NES version, and roughly a decade later, respectively, minus the top few levels, of course. Words cannot express how heinously eclipsed and outweighed this shmup title has become throughout the years. As I always recommend with every other game that falls under said criteria, looking at you, Imperium. If you've endlessly relished and envied the likes of Sidearms, Section Z, Forgotten Worlds, Troubleshooter, and other related titles, I cannot, cannot suggest Barai Fighter enough. So what are you waiting for? The release of another Dark Souls, Ultimedius, or Toho Project installment? Take my advice. Ignore these and track this down like a core ship already. At certain local outlets and online auctions, a loose copy should run you between 2 to 15 bucks, and a complete box copy should run you between 20 to 100 bucks, shit if maybe less. As ever, you will not regret it in the slightest. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God officially signing off. <laughs>